today we're going to shift gears. We're done talking about file systems, and uh, this sort of begins the potpourri part of the course. So today and Wednesday we'll talk about operating system structure, how we organize all the code and features that the operating system provides. So today we're going to do a lecture on operating system structure, and then I've asked you for Wednesday's class to read a paper about exokernels, which was a fairly fairly recent, sort of early 90s, um, uh, effort to reorganize operating systems in a, in a very different way that I think really does a nice job of highlighting the operating system's two responsibilities of multiplexing and providing abstractions. So you can see how those are separable because the exokernels only do one thing. Um, so, okay, announcements, please do assignment three. Uh, you have under three weeks left, two weeks from Friday. So the semester is rapidly drawing to a close. Uh, please finish up assignment three. Um, and also, I just want to point out, within that time period, you have an exam. So uh, you know, it would, the, the, the ideal solution would be just finish up assignment three, because clearly, the people haven't started. It's so easy. You might as well just take a day or two, just knock it out, and then you can relax and study for the exam, right? So that's just my suggestion. Just, you know, just, you know, spend a few hours you need to do assignment three now, uh, and then you'll have lots of time to study for the exam. Um, okay, so uh, the current max score is still a 69. Hasn't moved for a few days, so you guys are just kind of stuck in neutral here. Hopefully this trend doesn't continue for the next just under three weeks. Um, all right, so the paper for Wednesday, yeah, please read the exokernel paper. It's linked off the Piazza forum. Um, okay, so. Usually I find a moment within the semester to remind people about the collaboration policy for this course. Um, if you cheat, you will get an F in the course. If you cheat, your partner will get an F in the course. Really, you know, there are some exceptional situations here, but in general, you guys are jointly responsible for work that you submit as a team. So if your partner suddenly goes off for five minutes and comes back with a fully working assignment three core map, um, you might want to have a conversation about where it came from. So you guys work together on these assignments. Uh, you guys take joint credit for the work that you turn in. Um, so yeah, and, and the other thing is like we know how to use Google too. I just want to point that out. In fact, I would probably suggest that my abilities at using Google are better than yours. I know that's a strong statement. You guys are young, millennials or whatever, right? Uh, you know, you guys grew up using Google. You were drooling into the Google search bar when you were little kids or whatever. Um, but I'm older than you, and I've spent, I have more practice, right? So I think that I'm probably even a little bit better at using Google. I can certainly find online solutions. And we are building up, currently building up our repository of things to compare your assignment to. So you just have to think, if you found it online, what's the chances that we won't? Um, and I would suspect they're pretty small. So please don't do this. The point of these assignments, look, you can find these assignments online. No joke. But that's the point of doing them is to learn by starting with your own code. Start with the blank slate, build a working assignment three, and you guys will feel a tremendous sense of satisfaction, A, and not fail the course B. So there's multiple benefits to not, not cheat. All right, any questions about this? I hate having to bring this up again, but I just want to make sure everybody's heard it at least four or five times. Okay. So, um, talking about structure. So we've talked about, at this point in the semester, a bunch of the different responsibilities that the operating system has. You guys have been busy implementing some of these things in your own mini operating system. And there's a bunch of stuff that the operating system is responsible for. So the scheduling and process management things that we talked about a long time ago. Memory management, which you guys are working on now. Um, file systems, providing the file system interface and potentially providing implementations of certain file systems that the, file, that the system needs to boot. Uh, we've also, there's a bunch of stuff that we haven't talked about uh, that are, and I'm just trying to give you a sense of the totality of what the operating system is responsible for. So what are some of the operating system responsibilities or subsystems that we have not covered yet in class? Yeah, Isaac. Networking, kind of important, right? Protoc network protocol stacks, things like TCP, UDP, these are major. These are huge pieces of code that, the that, that are inside the operating system. What else? Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, user permissions, groups, uh, account, uh, accounting, job control. POSIX job control is just a nightmare to implement, apparently. Uh, we haven't really talked too much about signals. Yeah, what else? Uh, devices, sure. How, do, how does the operating system make devices available? Um, so all sorts of stuff. And this is just like kind of the tip of the iceberg. So the problem here is that things start to get complicated. So you might think, oh, okay, well, all I need to do is the process management that I wrote for assignment two, but then you realize that there's all this other stuff that has to happen as well, and pretty soon those things start to develop dependencies between each other, and then you have new things, and the new things have dependencies on the old things, and so pretty soon you end up with this really tangled mess of code. And operating systems can get extremely complicated in terms of their relationship to each other and their dependencies on each other. So the model that we've been talking about for this semester and a very common way of implementing operating systems is what's called the monolithic kernel. And so what the monolithic kernel does is it says, okay, well, there are user programs up here that are going to use the operating system API, which you guys are familiar with now. And there are devices down here that I have to protect and provide access to, to applications. And in between is everything else, right? This is the operating system, all one big blob of code that is, in a, that is sort of providing all the functionality needed for the user programs to use the devices that are connected to your computer safely. That's it. That's sort of the monolithic model. Um, and and what, so what does this mean in practice? It means all the OS code is loaded into one privileged shared address space. So there's no memory protection between different parts of the kernel. Some of you guys are discovering this right now when you're finding out, for example, that if your page allocator is broken, it can break all sorts of things, right? Anything, really, because all the parts of the kernel use memory, and so if you start managing memory wrong, all sorts of things that worked up until now are gonna stop working. Um, so all the OS code is privileged, so this means is as soon as I trap into the kernel, all the kernel subroutines run with a privilege level that allows them to do all sorts of powerful things to the machine. Adjust virtual memory mappings, use privileged instructions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in, in, this, you know, in this model, the OS is structured as one, not necessarily intentionally messy, but it's just a very, very complicated program. And as a result, it can get difficult to reason about and it can get hard, hard to work on. And so we'll talk today about some attempts to combat some of the results of this design. Um, but before we start talking about how to address this problem, why does this problem exist? Why have we decided to allow ourselves to write this one big blob of ugly code? Like, why? Why would I do this? You guys have been writing parts of an operating system yourself for the past couple months. You probably have some pieces of it that you're not super happy with. How did those come about? Why did, why did we end up here? Scott, do you want to guess? Oh, okay. He's guessing it an answer to a different question. Um, it's easy. I mean, this is sort of the natural progression that things take, particularly when you don't do a lot of careful planning beforehand. When you don't have rules about how things are going to happen, you just start, oh, okay, let's going to sit down, we're going to sit down and knock assignment three out today, and you start running, writing one huge function called VM fault, and pretty soon it has like thousands of lines in it, right? Um, and that's not necessarily the best way to do things. Um, but the, uh, you know, a less facetious reason is it's because it's really fast. So the overhead to transition between different parts of the kernel is just a function call. Right? All the kernels in the same address space. Other parts of the kernel essentially look like a library to the kernel. There's no overhead to the kernel calling another kernel function. There's overhead to the user getting inside the kernel, of course. We talked about that. But there's no overhead here. So this is very fast. Um, and, and this is really what drives things. And when we come back to different ways of organization later, keep this in mind. So this is really the reason why this happened. It's because there are dependencies between different subsystems and those dependencies are resolved most quickly if those subsystems can call each other directly and call each other's private interfaces and, and other sorts of functions. Okay, but let's talk about the problems with this approach and how modern operating systems have, modern monolithic operating systems have addressed them 
and we'll also talk about some different OS designs toward the end of the class that, that address some of these problems as well. Okay, so does anyone recognize this person? Who is this? Or what is this? No one knows? This is a Boy Scout, yeah. Are there Boy Scouts still? There are, right? They're in the news all the time for strange reasons. Um, all right, so here's our Boy Scout, right? And so how is a monolithic kernel not like this friendly Boy Scout? Maybe some of you guys were Boy Scouts. I was a Boy Scout. Not ashamed to say it anymore. I was for a while. Um, do you guys remember? What is, the, what is the hallmark of a Boy Scout? The Boy Scouts have a motto. Yeah. Be prepared. That's the Boy Scout motto. So if I have a monolithic kernel in the form that we've talked about, it means that you wrote this kernel, for example, OS 1621. You compiled it. You got it to work for assignment three, and you were pretty happy about yourself. And you shipped this out to some poor user who's using a machine from the 1970s. Um, but that user one day decided to plug in, I don't know, a new device. So what does the monolithic kernel do at this point? In the worst case, well, what would you potentially have to do? This is a new device. The device was created after you wrote the kernel. So what, what does the kernel designer have to do? Yeah. Rewrite the code. Um, yeah, you're going to have to go back and not, not you're going to have to recompile the operating system. And if any of you guys have played around with Linux before and made dumb choices when you configured Linux, you may have run into problems like this. Uh, because you can set up Linux so that it doesn't have support for the solution to this problem that we're going to talk about in a few slides. And when you do that, you better hope that whatever code you need is in the image because it's not changing. In certain cases, you have to do this. If you have very tiny devices uh, that don't have support for some of the things that we're about to talk about, but this is certainly a limitation. It means that it's very difficult for the operating system to change in response to new devices uh, or, or other uh, updates that I might want to install, right? So yes, this Boy Scout may be prepared to put up a tent, but he's not ready for your mouse, sorry. Um, neither is the MIPS, I doubt. Um, okay, so what about this cake, right? We've used the fail cake metaphor before, but I decided to find a different one this time, right? So how is the OS like this cake, the monolithic operating system? I mean, would you, guys, would you guys enjoy eating this cake? Yeah. yeah, it looks fantastic, right? So there's one, you know, one little small problem ruined this whole cake, right? Because this looks like a delicious cake, right? It's just, it's probably not going to be very well received by the people who it was intended for, even if it tastes really good, okay? So yeah, what happens if your monolithic kernel just has some small problem? What, 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 what's the result of that? Someone's going to be unhappy? <laughs> We're mapping the gap. Who's going to be unhappy and why? What is going to happen? Small little bug. Anywhere in the kernel. Yeah. The kernel is going to crash. Remember, all the code runs in a single address space with kernel privilege. And so buggy or poorly developed code can wreak all kinds of havoc. And certainly any sort of bug in the kernel anywhere can bring down the entire system. Um, and yeah, if, uh, I doubt that this was a computer problem, right? I mean, computers don't have this sort of bug, right? This is, a, this is clearly human error. Uh, okay, so a final metaphor, right? So how is the operating system like this PowerPoint slide? don't really have to read the slide. This, the topic of the slide is not really what I'm getting at here. Yeah, Ethan. It's really complicated, right? And so if, if you're trying to make a small change to the operating system, there becomes a lot of interdependencies that you may have to understand. You may want to just you know, change the order of a few of the operations at a particular point, but there are other parts of the system that rely on a particular function behaving a certain way or having certain side effects. Um, so I, I, just, I just want to point this out. This came from an article about the U.S. Army where apparently there are uh, 
officers whose entire job is to prepare PowerPoint slides for generals to give presentations. And that's what, that's what creates things like this. There is absolutely no information content in this slide at all, uh, as far as I can tell, other than it's complicated, right? And they could have just written that and saved themselves several days worth of work. Um, okay, so yeah, I mean, it's, so this, be, this can become a very impenetrable piece of code. It, it's huge, right? It's a huge, relative, I mean, not huge, I mean, there's probably bigger pieces of software, but it's a relatively large piece of software with a lot of internal interfaces and dependencies that has to work perfectly or things get very bad. And so this makes it very difficult for people to come in and fix things and solve problems and, and improve the system if they want to. Just hack out. I want to sit down with you know, Linux or another monolith operating system and build some new features, but the bar there is pretty high. And if I'm wanting to ship those features, the bar there is even higher, partly because I, it's hard to break the kernel down into small pieces and think about them independently. But we'll talk about some efforts to do that later. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, this, you know, okay. So, so let's talk about these three problems and we'll describe some potential solutions to them that have emerged in modern operating system designs. Okay. And again, this is not implying that these are the only three problems with monolithic kernels. There are other problems, but these are the ones that we're going to, to talk about. All right, so, okay. Rigidity, right? And, and what this refers to is this idea that the OS is fixed at some point. When you hit compile, when you install it onto your machine, you have an operating system that cannot be modified. Um, Potentially, now of course, if you want to reinstall the operating system or patch it, there are ways to do that. And many of you guys see your computers doing that all the time. That's a really important feature of modern operating systems. But normally that requires what? So usually when your computer wants to apply some updates, what does it normally require? A reboot. And, and keep in mind, right, so you may not be so irritated by this. I feel like my my computers need a reboot periodically just to sort of, you know, clear some of the snot out of their nose and like, you know, just, just to like give them a little bit of a break, right? Just a fresh start, you know? Some things are probably going wrong somewhere on the OS and so I don't mind rebooting them periodically just to, you know, keep those things down to a low roar. So who probably really dislikes this requirement? People who run servers, like websites, right? There are some servers where a little bit of downtime is really problematic. And so having to install updates that require reboots can be a really painful process. And actually there's been a lot of research in the OS community about how to avoid rebooting systems while still being able to apply hot patches and hot updates to the parts of the system that need to change. But in a lot of cases, and a lot of cases reboots are, I think they've done studies about operating systems like Windows and they've discovered that a lot of a lot of the reboots that are triggered by Windows aren't even necessary. They're just done, you know, just in case. Just in case something weird happens, we'll just reboot to get back to a known good state. Um, and of course, this is very frustrating to users. I think I remember installing a few pieces of software where I had to reboot multiple times, right? I mean, talk about terrible, okay. Um, so, and, and, you know, new devices on the fly, so can I plug something into my computer and have it instantly recognized and usable? Modifying the kernel behavior. So this is actually quite different and not something we're going to talk about in depth today, but there was a lot of research during the 90s on ways to modify kernel policies. So a particular application wants to use a different page replacement algorithm for its own pages that improves its own performance. How can you do that safely? That was the topic of of a lot of research for, for about a decade. And, and also li limitations to the degree that programs can help the operating system improve their performance. So this is also very interesting. It has a little bit to do with number two, but in general, there are cases where programs know something that the operating system would be assisted by learning. I know something about my own behavior that I would like to tell the operating system because it's going to help the OS allocate resources on my behalf, but I can't do that because of how the OS is designed. The OS has no way of listening to me and allowing me to help it improve my performance and potentially reduce load on the system, which is good for everybody. And most of these in, in involve some sort of trade-off between safety and performance. So 
there are certain things that I can do to improve performance if I know about all the code up front. Um, and making things work in a flexible way at runtime usually introduces some potential for crashes and other sorts of erratic behavior. So let's focus on number one. So the inability to modify the kernel on the fly. So this has been addressed by something that's called, something that is called loadable kernel modules. And the idea here is that I have a base kernel image. The goal is to be able to dynamically alter the kernel at runtime. So if the kernel needs a particular feature, like for example, you plug in a drive that has a certain file system on it, and the kernel says, uh-oh, I don't have that file system compiled into me directly. I don't have the code for that. So if I don't have this capability, I'm in trouble because I can't interpret the file system on the device that you just plugged in. The, the pro so the problem with, so you might think, okay, well, let's just apply the Boy Scout motto to the operating system and say it, be prepared. I will include every single file system known to man. I will just go through, and you can try this. You can set up Linux and you can configure it and you can just go through and hit every option, right? Support for everything, including networking protocols and weird stuff I've never heard of in some device that was invented by some guy in Latvia and is like, <laughs> only one person in the world has, but somehow is in the kernel tree, right? You can do that, right? And your kernel's massive, you know? And it is ready for anything. Of course, anything that was around at the time you compiled it, which is one problem. But the, but the problem with that is the kernel code starts to get huge. And there's all this unused code lying around. Now, on most systems, that stuff can get paged out to disk, but it still makes the kernel image really big and initially takes up a lot of memory. So that's not something that we want. Um, so the solution here are, is a way for the kernel to load what are called kernel modules on the fly at runtime. <coughs> kernel modules are compiled alongside the kernel. So these are normally binary modules, and thus they have to match the kernel very closely. So I can't use modules that were compiled for a different version of a kernel against another version because their interfaces may have changed and there may be other differences. And so if you try this on systems, it will normally complain um, vociferously if it allows you to do it at all. So these are compiled. These are generated at compile time. They're also shipped along with the kernel image. So when you look at Linux, you get a kernel and then you get a bunch of these kernel module objects that are included alongside of it. The kernel module objects can be independently recompiled. So this is really nice. It allows me to fix bugs potentially by rather than rebooting the operating system, unloading the module and reloading a version that has some bug fix or some change. To it. And they're stored on disk again alongside the kernel until they're needed. So what would happen is if the kernel sees, okay, you're putting in a file system that's been formatted with riser FS, nobody uses that anymore, but look, I've got a kernel module sitting here, ready to go, I'm gonna load that into my address space, which gives me access to the code required to interpret and modify a particular file. Okay. And most modern operating systems support this in one form or another. They're called different things, but they exist in, in most systems. Um, now, so let's, so let's talk about safety. So safety was our, our, second, uh, our second problem with monolithic kernels. And you, you might think, why is this a problem? I mean, we've been working on kernels for so long. Operating systems have been around for decades. Major operating systems that are out today are based on designs that were you know, dreamed up by people at Berkeley and IBM back in the 1960s. These are not new ideas. Um, so why? do we have all these crashes? Why, are there, why does your kernel, why does your OS still fail? Um, and if you think about it, blaming this on the operating system kernel is kind of counterintuitive because the kernel is the part of the system. I mean, of all the code out there in the world, win, the Windows core kernel may be the most tested code base on Earth. Uh, maybe some little pieces of it are more tested because they appear in other systems as well, but this code runs all the time on billions of devices all over the place. And Windows, of course, now has an extremely robust infrastructure for collecting information about faults and crashes and other types of data so they can improve their code. 
And these guys have been working on this for a long time. They're smart, well paid, um, and probably extremely well caffeinated. Uh, you know, there's free Coke at, at Microsoft all over the place. It's weird. I don't know why they do that. They probably they pay for it with the health benefits later. Um, okay, so and so here's the thing, right? Uh, you think there's been all this development. We have, and actually, we have all these better tools now for fault monitoring, crash analysis. Uh, why do we still have blue screens? Why do we still have failures in OS kernels? For, so, for a, <laughs> the, the reason, and, and of course, this is frustrating to no end to people who write kernels, is usually code outside of the kernel core. So at a particular period of time, Microsoft was estimating that 90% of crashes on Windows XP were caused by device drivers, not by core kernel code, by device drivers. Now, um, device drivers, of course, if, if you think about the core Windows developers, device drivers are written by people who have a lot less experience, They're written by people that don't work at Microsoft. They may be poorly paid, undercaffeinated, underexperienced, and they are the people who you have to trust. So when you plug in some sort of device that needs a dedicated driver, you have to trust that the person at whatever sort of printer company, right, uh, you are plugging in a device from is a skilled and crafty operating system developer. So suddenly you have invited this person who, again, works at a printer company to come in and play inside the privileged uh, environment created by your operating system. Hey, why not? You know, what harm could it cause? Um, and of course, the problem here uh, is that when your computer crashes or when your parents' computer crashes, other than you, who do they call? Who do they blame? Are they like, oh man, I can tell by the name of this driver that it's the HP printer driver again. I'm gonna give those HP people a call. No, who do they call? Who do they blame? They blame Microsoft, or they take something to the Apple store, or whatever. They blame the OS vendor because they think, oh, my computer failed. It's a Microsoft computer, whatever that means. Um, and it failed, therefore it must be Microsoft's fault. Um, so, you know, and, and this is the thing, like most of these types of errors are not caused by experienced hackers and extremely well-tested code. They're caused by uh, poorly tested new code for the continuous stream of new, new devices. So I just want to, so I thought this was fascinating um, and a, a, a chance for a good little learning moment about software engineering. Um, so they've done actually studies where they've looked at bugs and device drivers. And what they've discovered is that bugs and device drivers have a lineage to them. So you will see uh, bugs affect multiple versions of the same device driver. Now, why is that the case? So, you know, Logitech's coming out with SuperMouse 8.0, and you're the developer writing the driver for SuperMouse 8.0, so probably what do you start with? Yeah, the code for SuperMouse 7.9. And you cut and paste that and then you make whatever changes are needed to make the mouse one minor version, actually a major version, better, whatever that is. Uh, it probably is just a different color LED or something. Um, and then you go on with your life. And so what happens is when there was a bug that hasn't been discovered yet in the 7.9 driver that might be uncovered because of later downstream changes to the operating system, you're now affected by that bug as well, even if you didn't write the code simply because you used code that was written by somebody else without thinking too hard about it. And so you can see entire generations of device drivers that are affected by single bugs because people just kept building and reusing earlier code without really understanding much. And of course, as a software engineer, that makes sense. That's kind of what you would do. But this, is, this was just an interesting finding. So as, as a, someone who is going to write code that someone might care about in the future and want to work, What's the, what's the motto here? Of course, this has gotten worse for you guys, because you guys have way more places that you can cut and paste code from. So what, what is a, and, and, and those places are great, right? I am certainly not going to say that Stack Overflow and Google and you know, all these online tutorials, I mean, the internet is the best way to learn how to program, period. But 
What do you need to be careful of? Don't use code you don't understand. Right? Don't go to Stack Overflow and pattern match something and grab a blob of code and, and cut and paste it into your Android app that you're going to distribute on behalf of, on behalf of M and Bank or something like that. Right? Just don't do that. It's a terrible idea. It's not necessarily to say that you can't find solutions that other people have designed other places. That's a great way to write code as long as you're not writing it for this class. But understanding the code that you bring in and take responsibility for is really important because at the end of the day, that's your code. When it starts crashing and, user and customers are complaining and your boss comes into your office, he's not going to like it if you say, well, blame Stack Overflow, <laughs> right? I'm going to go downvote that answer right now, right? Who cares, right? It's too late. Um, and it, I, we, so we, we had a faculty candidate recently who had done all of this really cool research where she looked, did source analysis of GitHub repositories and found various patterns of people reusing code from other projects. And my response to this was pretty simple. I said, why don't we just turn off cut and paste, copy and paste in Eclipse entirely, right? Just get rid of it. Why does Eclipse have this feature? It's totally unnecessary. You should not use copy and paste. Or when you do, it should stall for like several minutes, right? It, it should pop up one of those dialogues. Are you really want to do this? Do you really want to do this? You have to click OK maybe five times, right? Just think about this. This is, because this can really, you know, copy and paste can be very, usually copy and paste is a bad sign anyway. It's a sign that you've, you haven't really designed your code very carefully. Because now you have two identical copies of the same code that you have to maintain. Now that's hard to do. Okay. There's been a lot of work in this area. I, I'm, you know, this slide is not even close to being up to date. Um, Windows tries to get people to write device drivers that can run without kernel privilege and use various APIs that are provided by Windows. Um, there was years of work on trying to automatically synthesize device drivers from the hardware specification. So can I take the hardware specification and automatically produce the code necessary to run the device? Biggest problem with that is the hardware specification is usually wrong. And so uh, that usually produces device drivers that don't work that well. Um, when we get to virtualization in a couple weeks, there's been some work on using virtualization techniques to try to allow device drivers to run safely and not crash the kernel. So again, 90% of the blue screens at a particular point in time were caused by this. This issue got a lot of attention from a lot of people, certainly from Microsoft. Um, and no, the normal approach here is to try to isolate the faults caused by device drivers and just make sure that they don't crash the entire system. If your magic mouse 8.0 stops working, that's okay. Might need to unplug it and plug it back in. But I don't want a blue screen of death. I don't want the whole system to crash. So, Another route to safety that's been explored in a variety of projects is using, um, using software to, to start to replace some of the features that we normally rely on hardware to perform. One of, the area, one of the really sort of hot research areas here is on trying to write operating systems code in languages that are not C. So I think C is a dead language. I'm sorry you guys are learning this semester. You have to to write operating systems code. But if you have a job offer, if, if I had one job offer where someone was saying we're going to write in C, and the other one where the guy was saying we're going to write in Go or we're going to write in Python, take the other one, right? That company is more well positioned to succeed. Unless the people are doing embedded devices or whatever. But there are very few domains left where C is really a useful language. You guys are finding out why. It's really hard to write C code. So there's a bunch of projects that have tried to implement operating systems that are fast using managed code, code where I don't have to explicitly allocate and free objects. And of course, that addresses all sorts of safety problems. So there's something called the Singularity Project at Microsoft. The SEL4 project, which is something that uh, people worked on at NICTA, took a different approach to this, where they were actually able to prove by writing formal specifications for different parts of their code, that the code was correct. And we'll come back to this when we talk about microkernels. It's not something that you can do easily with a big monolithic kernel. Um, and suddenly, if you guys have heard of garbage collection, how many people have heard of garbage collection? All right, you guys use Java, so you know what Java garbage collection is. Most, you know, if you write code today to solve a problem, please use a live language that has garbage collection, unless you have a real big performance problem. Uh, because it works. It's a great feature. 
Um, of course, now it's really interesting because it's being done in the kernel and it really has to work and it really has to work fast and not cause other things to slow down. I suspect that within your lifetime, I'm going to make a bold prediction here. Within your lifetime, we will have operating system kernels that will be written without using C. That will be written entirely in languages that provide some form of managed memory. I just think that's the direction we're going. Computers are going to be faster, and this, you know, we have a whole, we have legacies of decades and decades of really, really well-tested code bases that are written in C, but I think that's coming to an end. And there's people working on uh, writing operating systems in languages like Go, for example, which have not only memory management, but fantastic support for concurrency, which is something that we care about now because all of our computers have multiple cores. Okay. So now let's talk about complexity, and this is where we get into talking about a little bit about the history of OS design. So let's take a step backwards and say you guys are normal software developers and you're approaching a big software development project. What would you normally do? What's the right way to proceed here? Write main and then write all the code inside main. Anybody for that? One huge case statement. Uh, one big blob of code with a lot of go-tos. There we go, yeah. Super high performance. No, no way. What would you do? Break it down into little pieces. Break it down into little pieces with well-defined interfaces, things that you can test independently. You guys are realizing how frustrating it is when you can't do that. It's always people say, well, how do I test assignment two before I have write working? You can't. It's impossible. Your user programs can't say anything to you. So there's a certain amount of dependencies to that assignment that people find frustrating for entirely this reason. But as software engineers, we would break things down into little pieces, put well-defined interfaces between them, and that would give us the ability to test the system and understand the system in smaller units. The other thing we might want to do as an OS developer, given the unique role that the operating system plays, is use this technique to also minimize what in security they might call the trusted code base. But here we would call the code base that can crash the computer. So the code that actually has to run in privileged mode with complete access to the machine. So this spawned this, or, this principle of not only trying to break the kernel up into well-defined independent, well-defined pieces with really good interfaces between them, but also minimizing the privileged code base led to a design that are called, that's called microkernel design. Mainly, it describes what it's trying to do. It's trying to make the actual OS kernel as small as possible. So here is my typical monolithic operating system, and you can see that all of these features, the file system interface, interprocess communication, scheduling of virtual memory, device drivers, thread dispatch, things like this, are all handled by one piece of privileged code. What the microkernel does is it reduces the privilege code base to a small set of core features. And then everything else is implemented on top of it. So these servers, they're sometimes called in microkernel designs, do not run with kernel privilege. They are part of the kernel. They are relied on by applications to do the things that the current, they're used to having the kernel do, like read and write and fork and things like this, but they do not necessarily require kernel privilege. So for example, one of the things that got people very excited about early microkernel designs was this idea, this grand goal that we've, I don't think, really, uh, ever managed to accomplish, that I could have a single operating system that could provide different flavors of interface. So for example, I could have my Unix server that would provide the Unix system call API. And what, what did I always want right next to my Unix server? So it's like the holy grail of operating system design for a certain type of person for a while. Unix server and then, I mean, clearly I, I only want to run Unix because all the best computer games run on Linux. What do I have next to my Unix server? My Windows server. I can provide multiple interfaces to the same low-level functionality. There's all these, it'd be fun to do a lecture on all the interesting projects over a period of time that try to get Windows applications to run on Linux. 
I think, I think there's still tools out there that are trying this. None of them have been hugely successful. Virtualization kind of took over at a certain point. That's pretty much what we do now. Um, so for example, device drivers. I can move most of the device drivers out of the privileged code base and just allow them to access these basic services that are provided. So one of the most important basic services was um, IPC, right? Simple inter-process communication. And the reason for this, of course, is you can imagine that now, remember we talked about the fact that one of the reasons monolithic kernels are fast is because communication between different parts of those systems can be implemented through a simple function call, which is extremely low overhead. Now, if my file server wants to talk to my virtual memory interface, it has to go through this interface provided by the privileged code base. And potentially, certain types of behavior require communications between multiple of these application servers. For example, my Unix server probably needs to communicate with the file server or multiple file servers to implement things like open, close the file API. So IPC, really fast IPC became really important. Um, and so that was one of, the, uh, one of the contributions of microkernels. And everything else was implemented as a user level process. So file systems, you can implement the address space abstraction as a user level process that relies on a small layer that does virtual memory translation that's implemented in a microkernel. Um, and then these user level services. Now, now in theory, this was the nice thing about the microkernel. So if there's a bug, for example, in your file system implementation, it doesn't have to crash the whole system. Instead, that server that's providing that feature crashes, and then it can be restarted without restarting the entire system. Now, the limits to what this is actually practical vary. For example, you probably, there would probably be a number of parts of the system that would be affected if the root file system suddenly crashed and had to be restarted. That might cause some problems in other servers as well. But that was the goal. Um, so this was a uh, sort of really hot topic in the research community in the 80s and 90s. Um, and, and what happened here is it was pretty simple. The, the microkernel movement uh, trades off clarity and some of these features like being able to fail services for overhead. So I am increasing the overhead of everything, a lot of things that go on in the kernel because they have to be done through message passing through this microkernel. And so the overheads of these systems, at least at a particular point in time, were always prohibitive, and it made them very difficult to compete with monolithic designs. Now, there were two common ways to improve microkernel performance. What's the most obvious? How do I make a microkernel faster? I've got these, this overhead caused by the modularity that I've introduced into my system. So how do I make the microkernel faster, get rid of some of that? Yeah, so move things back into the microkernel. So one, so one way to improve microkernel performance is to say, okay, well, uh, actually we've reconsidered. This thing really needs to be inside the microkernel, the trusted kernel. It needs to one with privilege mode, and that's because it just creates so many problems and so much overhead, and that wasn't really a fantastic it wasn't a super satisfying result. The other thing that people did was they just hammered away at the microkernel itself. They implemented an assembly. You know, they said that, oh, microkernels should really be device specific. You should not, you should not write your microkernel in a high level language because it's too slow. You have to write it in assembly for every different architecture. Not something that sounds like fun to me. Maybe you guys like writing assembly code, um, but anyway. So a lot of the, now, now the nice things that came out of the microkernel movement were a real emphasis on OS design and interfaces. What should the interfaces between components be? I can implement something that looks and behaves a lot like a microkernel, but all runs in the same address space as a monolithic design. From an organization perspective, it shares a lot of the benefits of the microkernel, although it does have some of the drawbacks of monolithic kernels, like one part can fail the whole system. Um, the, so the, the formal verification I talked about before, where there was a group that was actually able to prove that an OS was correct, this was done using a microkernel. There's no way you could do this on a bigger kernel design. It would just get too complicated. It already took a team of something like 50 people, five years to do it. So 
If you made a bigger kernel, it would get probably exponentially more complex. Um, and microkernel also contributed a lot of really elegant work on, particularly on IPC. So that was cool. OK. Um, so there is, I don't know, I just like to talk about something that seems like it's trying to strike a middle ground. There was something called hybrid kernels, um, where essentially I would try to design a kernel that was designed like a microkernel but all ran in the same address space. Uh, the original Windows NT design was supposed to be a hybrid kernel. Uh, most people thought this was just marketing, uh, including Linus. But again, it's not necessarily a bad idea to try to imitate some of the nice interfaces and modularity of microkernels, even if all that code is going to run as a monolithic kernel. Okay, so um, exokernels, we're going to talk about in detail on Wednesday, so I'll just skim, skim over this. Uh, they produce a very different split in how I design kernels, and again, we'll talk about this in detail on Wednesday. Uh, mul so multi-kernels are an even new, newer kernel design, where what they do is they say, there are more and more cores inside your machine, more and more computational units. So first of all, there's the multiple cores that are on your main processor. What are these other cores? I think when they look at the iPhone now, it has something like 30 different processors in it. Where are, what are, what are these other cores doing? What are they? Yeah. Yeah, like MP3 encoders, GPUs, you know, specialized chips that do pr radio processing and things like this. So there's all of these computational units inside your system. They don't usually have a shared access to a shared memory space. So the Molkai kernel design says, let's forget shared memory. We're going to implement everything with message passing. And what they try to do, you know, to put this very shortly, is apply the dis sort of nice distributed systems uh, properties to designing an OS. They say the machine and your, you know, your, your, your system is now a distributed system, even if it's in a single device, and we're going to apply distributed system design principles to designing your OS. OK. So, you know, who cares about all this, right? Hopefully you guys do a little bit. You've been sitting there for 45 minutes looking, at least looking slightly interested, some of you, right? Some of you have, your eyes have been drooping, but some of you guys seem like you're wide awake. Um, maybe you're poking yourself with your pencil or something periodically. I used to do that sometimes in class. Um, so, you know, this is, so the, the, the lessons to learn here from a software engineering perspective are, are you know, designing large software is hard. Right? I think we all know this. If you if you've haven't worked on a large software project, you will someday probably pretty soon after you graduate. You'll get hired by a company, and it's very unlikely that that company is going to say, hello, brand new software engineer. We'd like you to start a clean slate project uh, from ground zero, and you are the first person to ever hack on this. Good luck. Uh, it's probably going to be like, we need you to fix the bug in this 100,000 line code base that was written by a bunch of idiots that have all been fired or quit. Um, so that's much more likely. Uh, so, and, and, this, and so this sort of drives my overall advice to you guys, which is, in, you know, until your code has to be just screamingly fast, break it into pieces, keep those pieces simple, do a good job of designing your interfaces, and I would add to this, use a powerful high-level language. Don't write stuff in C unless someone forces you to, right? Even C++ is. C++ is a dead language. I should be careful saying that on camera. You know, the amount of funding we're going to get from our industrial partners just nosedived, right? <laughs> what? C++ is not dead? Yes, it's dead. In the future, right, where we're all going to be living. Um, OK. So the last thing I want to finish with today is interfaces. Because, you know, for those of you that are struggling with assignment three, I want to give you some advice about what assignment three really is. Um, and I would say that a lot of us as programmers, we typically rush to start writing code. And that's normal because programming is fun. I like to program. I like to write code. But I think one of the things we've been trying to get you to do in the class with design documents is actually think about design and design interfaces. And interfaces matter. Um, what are, so what are interfaces? And don't, <laughs> please don't tell me some sort of Java-based definition. Right? Because interfaces are a concept that is not, Java did not make up interfaces, believe it or not. Um, 
So an interface defines how two unrelated and independently developed pieces of software interact with each other. They uh, define the assumptions that users of the interface are allowed to make. And good interfaces do a good job of explaining what the code does and allowing the code to change over time. So good interfaces allow, if, if you have a good interface, somebody else can come in, look at it, understand what your code does, and use it effectively. That is super important. That is probably the number one, your number one goal as a software developer because you're going to be working on teams, you're going to be writing code other people are going to be using. The easier it is for them to use your code, the more they're going to like you. They may not like you, you know, like directly like hugging you or whatever, but like they're going to like you in this indirect way. They're going to be like, wow, that library I used on that project was awesome. It really helped me out. Huh, I wonder who that guy is or that woman is. Okay? Um, the other thing interfaces allow you to do as the developer is they allow you to improve your code without changing. So, you know, best case scenario, people start using this beautiful new library that you've written, but now you realize there's all these things I want to do to improve it and change it. If you write a good interface, you can do that and nobody notices except that they notice, wow, that code just got a lot faster. I wonder what super programmer person did. Uh, so that's, that's the tension with interfaces. Interfaces need to be specific enough to tell you what the code does, but flexible enough to allow you to improve the code. Um, and also, of course, to break things up so you can test and verify them. This is also super important. So assignment three is really an assignment about interfaces. If you guys have started it, you've started to realize this. That's what's fun about assignment three. It is not one big blob of code. I hope it is not when you guys are done. There are a lot of internal interfaces for you guys to design as you design assignment three, and to the degree that you guys do a good job of designing those interfaces, you will find yourself to be a much happier person and much more successful. Okay, so on Wednesday we will talk exokernels. Please look over the paper. It's a cool paper. I promise you will like it if you try to read it. <laughs>